Hello, today is December 14th and I'm doing this recorded presentation for my keynote address on December 15th at 10 o'clock Paris, France time. And uh, the keynote address is going to be a joint for joint conference, which is the IoT SMS and the SNAMS NAMS conference. And I'm Bhavani Thuraisingham from the University of Texas at Dallas. And thank you very much for inviting me to give this keynote address. And I'm very honored. I wish we were all together in person at this conference, but unfortunately we cannot. And I'm hoping that next year, which is 2021, uh, around December, we can all meet in person. Anyway, so I'm going to, the reason I'm recording this presentation in case there is a technology glitch, because I'm going to give this presentation around 24 hours from now, in case there is a technology glitch, but I will be present at the conference virtually. And so the organizers can uh, play this presentation and then I'll be there to answer questions or I can give the presentation live. Thank you very much. And so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, I guess, uh, yeah. So, okay, so, right, so I'm sharing my screen and so the title of my talk, Integrating Artificial Intelligence and Cybersecurity with Applications in Internet of Transportation and Social Media. So I tried to select two applications. Uh, one is Internet of Transportation, which is sort of related to Internet of Things. And the other is Social Media, which is of course related to SNAMS. So, uh, so then, what I'm going to do, so here is the outline of my presentation. So first I'm going to talk about some general stuff, integrating cybersecurity and artificial intelligence. I call it SecAI. And then there are three subtopics, big data security and privacy, machine learning for cybersecurity and cybersecurity for machine learning. And the second topic is Internet of Transportation. So first I'm going to talk about security for Internet of Transportation, and then I'm going to apply part one to part two. And that is the role of AI in secure Internet of Transportation. Part three is going to be on social media, cybersecurity and AI. So first I'm going to talk about AIDS, Artificial Intelligence Data Science for Social Media, and then discuss security and privacy for social media and then cloud-based social media and then summary and direction. So I've got about an hour. I've already talked for about three or four minutes. So I'm going to try and go a little bit fast because of the fact that I'm trying to uh, sort of uh, talk to sort of two conferences so that both uh, conferences will find this keynote presentation relevant. I'd like to thank our sponsors as well as my colleagues. Okay, so part one, integrating cybersecurity AI ML data science. So in 2014 I, fall, I organized a workshop funded by the National Science Foundation, and that was on big data management, security and privacy. So due to technological advances and novel applications, it is now possible to capture process analyze large amounts of data for a number of tasks, healthcare, for disease outbreaks, COVID-19, uh, as well as security tasks, financial tasks, retail, so everything. Such tasks, security tasks include user authentication, access control, anomaly detection, user monitoring, protection from inside the threat, and so on. Analyzing and integrating data collected on the web, we can identify connections and relationships among individuals that may in turn help with homeland protection, disease outbreaks. Collected data 
even if we anonymize it, say remove identifiers, you can take multiple records, remove the identifiers and put them together and you'll be able to re-identify the individuals. So as you collect massive amounts of data, then there is a privacy problem. Because security tasks such as authentication and access control, you, need to re, you may need to, re, um, to collect detailed information about the user, such as multi-factor authentication. And this detailed information, if misused or stolen, can lead to privacy breaches. Of course, there's another problem. These machine learning techniques that we are using to solve you know, various problems like big data analytics for cybersecurity or otherwise healthcare, uh, financial applications, these machine learning techniques could be attacked. And then we will not be able to trust these machine learning techniques. So what are some of the directions? Access control models, right? So when you have massive amounts of data, does role-based access control or attribute-based access control, do they work? Are there special types of access control models? And I will not be going into that particular topic today. I will talk a little bit about privacy enhanced techniques and of course, big data analytics, analytics for cybersecurity and security uh, for machine learning. So I'm sort of looking at the time just to make sure that I am on track. Okay, so some background. I introduced the idea of data mining, security, and privacy, the privacy violations that could occur due to through data mining at a keynote address I gave at the IFIP 11.3 in 1996 in Como, Italy, and then later at the Pacific Asia Knowledge Discovery and Data Mining Conference in 1998 in Melbourne, Australia, and published a, a landmark paper. I call it a landmark paper because uh, if you... Uh, if you are a program director at the National Science Foundation and if you write a paper, then of course, you know, it gets attention and it gets uh, um, citations. So that was in 2002 and that spawned a new area of research. At the same time, around that time, uh, researchers from IBM Almaden Research Center, they uh, developed what's called privacy preserving data mining. So the whole idea is that you've got the original data, you add some noise, then you have X prime, noise added, and you have a modified data mining process. You add noise so that the individual values will not be divulged. But then the final modified data mining result should not should be the same. That's a whole challenge. That's a challenge, right? Because you don't want wrong or different data mining results. So then when I joined the University of Texas Dallas in October uh, 2004, I had a PhD student. That was the first project we started and also uh, with one of my colleagues, so we co-supervised Dr. Li Liu, and she did some very good work. She did some very good, interesting work on perturbation method, as well as privacy preserving decision trees. Okay, so there was a lot of work on privacy preserving data mining by various researchers, then came big data. So because of big data, this privacy, uh, privacy is exacerbated, right? Because you've got lots of data now that's being collected. So we hosted this workshop, in 2014 fall, and I presented the results at the interagency working group in 2015. And there were some research efforts that came as a result of this uh, workshop and my presentation. Okay, so one of our projects is on privacy aware quantified self, and that's a policy base. So that's really policy aware is what our major focus and we develop a data uh, management framework. So we have a smartphone. You can do data collection, data storage and access, data analytics, data sharing from health, fitness, location, social media, image, video, other data sources. Some of the data, because you can't store everything in a smartphone. So some of the data encrypted and backed up in the cloud storage and some others anonymized and provide cloud-based services. So this is what we are developing, right? So policies, we are saying policies have to guide data collection, data storage, data analytics, data sharing. So that's our main focus. So for example, uh, as policy aware data collection, what do we mean? More and more data being collected, storage on the device will not be sufficient to store all of the data. We envision encrypted cloud storage and all the data is pushed or less frequently accessed data, but policies have to govern this entire process. 
And then based on access control policies, you can say local apps running on the device will be given access to some of the data. And when needed, these apps will be allowed to access some of the encrypted data. And in some cases, the data may not be need, needed in fine grain form because if you have say a 20 year old, right? You don't need to weigh his or her daily weight, right? You don't, you don't need to gather that. But for a 70 year old situation would be different, right? So, so that's another thing. And in certain other cases, um, data may have to be deleted uh, to preserve privacy, deleted and or generate fake location data to hide the fact that a person participated in a protest. And so, uh, so these are all po policies have to dr drive these processes. We en envision that data sharing and analytics will be carried out using services in the cloud. And based on different scenarios, some of the data could be sent without any modifications, like heart rate and so on. And some others will have to be anonymized, right? Because, you know, when you have all of the, like here, right, your Fitbit data and various other things that you are collecting, uh, because you've got to be careful and the glucose monitoring, because if, say, these uh, healthcare insurance companies find out that you have diabetes, then your children or your parents or your siblings could be our grandchildren could be denied coverage. So this is what we have developing mobile apps, data access framework, and the cloud based encrypted data store. Okay, so that's uh, big data security and privacy. So the other topic is, Again, I'm talking about SecAI, integrating cybersecurity and data science. So the other topic is machine learning for cybersecurity, big data stream classification. So what are we doing here? We can use past data to build classification model, predict the label of future instances, and it helps with decision making. This is sort of known. We've been doing this for about 20, 20 years. But what's the challenge here? We have big data streams. Data is continuously arriving. As the data arrives, the concepts are changing. So today it could be by Microsoft, tomorrow it's by uh, Google, next day it's going to be by Facebook, then by Amazon and, and next day by Apple. So concepts are changing. So one model is not going to do it. You develop an ensemble of models and then some of the old models may no longer be valid. So these models work together, sometimes with human in the loop and they discard the old models. And then you have the testing data and then you block and quarantine if it's, uh, if it's uh, malicious, otherwise you store it in a server, right? So that's really sort of the uh, interesting uh, challenge, developing this ensemble of models and throwing away all models. And so we applied it to insider threat detection. Uh, again, insider threat detection requires identification of rare anomalies, right? So these are bad people pretending to be good people, right? And that's true in the processes because this could be like a compiler process or an operating system or a database or some application. Per, it looks like very innocuous, but it could be potentially deadly, very serious. So uh, we have designed and developed ensemble of stream mining algorithms. And uh, we've applied both uh, support vector machines, one class support vector machines for uh, supervised learning and graph based anomaly detection for unsupervised learning. Okay, so because of lack of time, and I'm going to sort of skip this chart, I talked about the essential points. And so this is our architecture. So we've got uh, an ensemble of models, okay, so K, K I, uh, I chunks, and we develop an ensemble of models and then feature extraction and so on, throw away some of the old models, uh, algorithms uh, unsupervised could be graph based and supervised would be one class support vector machines. And then we extract features. And then of course, uh, I, I plus one chunk arrives and we extract the features and do testing. If it's anomaly, then it's anomaly, otherwise it's not. And so again, the challenge is to develop this ensemble of models. Okay, so that's, uh, data mining, data science, machine learning for cybersecurity. However, what happens if these machine learning techniques are attacked? What do we mean? So uh, violation of standard adversary mo modifies data to defeat learning algorithms. So we are applying machine learning. The adversary is watching, looking at our data, right? And so it's trying to thwart our models, thwart our data, poison our data. It's not, so we've got to understand adversarial learning. It's not concept drift, 
It's not online learning. Adversary adapts to avoid being detected. During training time, like data poisoning, during test time, modifying features when data mining is deployed. And so a game is being played. So look at this. So you've got the red squares, which are bad instances. And then you've got the blue circles, which are good instances. And this is the support vector machine boundary. See what happens. The red instances where the adversary has learned, right? It's pushing the red instances into this, this part so that it won't get caught, right? So what do we do? We, okay, before we do anything, we've got to understand the model. So we, I mean, in theory, adversary can look at uh, numerous attacks, right? It can, but we are only looking at two types of attacks, free range attacks where adversary can move malicious data anywhere in a particular domain. And then the other is a targeted attack. So the details are in our knowledge discovery ACM KDD paper. And so again, I won't go into the details, but please uh, email me. I've got all our email addresses at the end. So we'll be happy to share the information. So this is what happens, right? So all these red squares here are bad instances and these green circles are good instances. This is the support vector machine boundary. Black dash line is a standard classification boundary. We are doing a lot of mathematical calculations as to how the adversary is adapting and pushing this boundary to this line, blue line. So once, look at this, once we push this boundary, so again, a threat model, uh, attacker modifies X to X prime, modified packet length by adding dummy bytes, good word to spam email, nice to an image. So once we have pushed, a lot of these, uh, the bad instances will be caught. Okay, before that, it was not caught because this was our boundary. You could ask the question, we can move this blue line right here. But no, if you move, then all these good instances will show as bad instances. So we don't want false positives and we don't want false negatives. So our challenge is to move this support vector machine boundary to this particular line, blue line here, to catch as many bad instances as possible. Okay, so another thing I just wanted to talk about this is that Intel is coming up with that, has come up with that SGX, right? It's a trusted analytics platform, uh, SGX enabled data analytics platform. And so another way, of course, we have to study the adversary, but if you want to trust the machine learning algorithms, maybe we used Intel's, and we've done a lot of work, uh, Intel's SGX data analytics platform, it comes with uh, you know, runtime libraries, application memories, and so on, and encrypted code and SGX enclave memory uh, to carry out the secure computations. But there are some papers, articles I read, is this really secure? Okay, so we need to, we've done a lot of work on this, uh, but there are some concerns, but at least for now, you know, it's providing a, a viable solution, but we've got to learn more about this. Okay, it's just in passing. So this finishes, my first part, right? So talked about big, big data security and privacy. Then I talked about data science for machine learning, or the, sorry, machine learning for cybersecurity and what happens if the machine learning techniques are attacked. My part, uh, actually this is part, uh, actually part two, okay, I've got three parts. So I call it part three. If I do it live, I'm going to correct this, part two. So AI MLDS for Internet of Transportation Systems. So what is this? So the Internet of Transportation is an aspect of Internet of Things, except that we are talking about transportation. We've got all of these cars, and then we've got uh, trains and talking to cars, and trucks talking to each other, and roadworks, essentially to have an efficient transportation system. All of these, uh, uh, all of these uh, transportation systems are connected, right? It could be land, it could be sea, it could be air, but the challenge is the security. What happens if these systems are attacked, right? It's going to cause complete chaos. So Internet of Transportation, uh, major implications in the transportation industry, autonom autonomous vehicles improve day-to-day -day activities. Uh, they, uh, they say in US trucks alone carry estimated 63.3% of the freight of goods. AVs are not limited to ground. They also have sea vehicles and ships and drones 
air vehicles, and so on. Levels of automations for AVs range from zero to five. Ground vehicles have lower levels of automation, level two, and aerial vehicles have higher level, which is level four. And companies are investing heavily. GM spent $728 million uh, in 2018 with plans to increase to 1 billion in 2019. I need to get those 2019 figures because 2020 could even be more. So we need to, and 20 is almost ending. So while there's great potential in AVs, right? Improvements again, due to the transportation industry, security and privacy are major concerns. Security and privacy, okay. AVs, uh, uh, evaluate the environment using a variety of sensors, camera, GPS, internal measurement units, LIDAR, radar, and so on. Previous research has shown that sensors are susceptible to malicious tampering, such as IMU susceptible to sound waves and GPS uh, susceptible to spoofing signals. Uh, vehicles should verify the veracity of sensor signals upon acting. So you have here sensor-based AVs rely on sensors to evaluate. Sensors are susceptible to GPS spoofing and so on. Uh, classical computer security, memory management, protection, and cryptography, you know, not sufficient. It doesn't work. So we have to look at its real-time constraints, AVs trust and act upon very quickly. Okay, coming back here, beyond security, there's also privacy, right? So we need the infrastructure because many people, like I may not want to say, let's say I'm smoking, which I don't, by the way, in the car. I don't want people to find out. Right, because some of the cameras uh, take pictures of me and then they can send it to my insurance companies and then my insurance premiums will go up, right? Or I don't want my location to be known. So privacy is important. From user's perspective, privacy concerns arise from all the information needed by such system that could lead to private information being exposed. So legislators, engineers, and scientists should keep privacy concerns in mind, right? As we make advances in IoT, okay. So our algorithm, we've come up with a very simple algorithm, physics-based anomaly detection. So we want to build a reference monitor using a physics-based anomaly detection, PBAT. So our algorithm is consisting of three parts, building a model offline of the AV's physical invariance, implementing an online tool to monitor expected and observed behavior to detect anomalies. And of course, we raise an alarm if significant residual difference exists. So offline, processing online and anomaly. Okay, so it was presented at the, um, one of the top cybersecurity conferences, which is Usenet Security. Okay, so detailed design, this is the physical model. And you can see there are states and there are uh, moments of inertia and mass of vehicles, drag factor and so on. So offline pre-processing, we build this model, right? AV invariants are calculated using a well-known linear model. So these are what control theorists use. Uh, accelerometer, gyroscope, magnetometer, sensor data uh, on the X, Y, and Z axis is used for the aerial vehicle. Vehicle positioning and steering angle is used for the ground vehicle. For online stage, we use just extended Kalman filter, which has been used uh, for control systems and in various electrical engineering applications. is used to predict AV's physical behavior by estimating unknown parameters from noisy input that the algorithm is divided into two sections predict and correct the estimation before it's compared against the sensor data. For anomaly detection, we use an existing technique, CUSUM, C-U-S-U-M algorithm is then used to detect persistent at attacks. An alarm is raised if the residual difference is larger than a predefined threshold. So it might seem actually quite uh, straightforward, but when you put it all together, building this model, because we are not dealing with, say, network data or database data, operating system data. This is sensor data and the, the nature of the data is very different, okay? And they are built on, based on these physical models. Okay, so physical implementation, we did it for uh, aerial and land. For aerial, we had an intelligent to fly drones, right? It had a PX4 flight controller focused on detecting GPS spoofing and gyroscope attacks. GPS attacks are detected after 0 0.2 seconds while gyroscope attacks are detected after 1.5 seconds. Overhead introduced 5.4332%. Okay, so the ground vehicles custom built on top of Traxxas Ford Fiesta, Rally HSA controller, ROS uh, Kinetic came focused on detecting visual attacks on the camera, attacks detected rather quickly, 1, 0.1 seconds, overhead is less, 2.25%. Each threshold produces a probability of false alarms of approximately 2%. Okay, so that is the, our security algorithm. 
technique. Now, how do we bring in part one into part two? Data science, AI for transportation security, right? So we talked about internet of transportation subject to attacks, fine. On the other hand, streaming data being collected by sensor data, streaming data, including autonomous and in future driverless vehicles. As transportation systems go electric, we also need energy conservation because due to attacks, security attacks, right? It could cause massive damage. We could get stranded on lonely highways um, and due to attacks on energy management. So can we enhance our extended Kalman filter and Kusum algorithm with data science machine learning techniques? Or can we just apply just data science machine learning techniques, right? So can stream analytics be applied to say financial data that we have applied to financial and telecom data be applied to transportation data? The main question is to understand the nature of the complex transportation data and adapt our stream analytics techniques to handle massive amounts of such heterogeneous sensor data. So this is the future. Another future is, of course, adversarial machine learning. What happens if these machine, the machine learning techniques, without a doubt, is going to help Internet of Transportation to detect the best routes and look at prevent accidents and talk about communicating between these different uh, different vehicles and so on. Without a doubt, we are going to use machine learning. What happens if these machine learning techniques are attacked, right? So. Internet of transportation systems will depend heavily on data science, AI, ML, right? Driving without a human in the loop and many more. The adversary will be learning the models used by the vehicles as well as learn about the data used in the training of the models. Uh, adversary will attempt to thwart the vehicle's learning process, just like I mentioned earlier. Therefore, the learning algorithms have got to adapt to thwart the adversary. We've got to be one step ahead are several steps ahead. Eventually, it becomes game playing between the adversary and us, the vehicle's machine learning algorithms challenge. What sort of game? Is it zero sum? Is it Bayesian? Is it Stackelberg? So research is only beginning on this topic with respect to transportation systems. Of course, for regular cybersecurity researchers, adversarial machine learning is becoming one of the most important research topics. Okay, remember I talked about privacy of your policy-based data management framework, you know, for the smartphones with healthcare data, social media data. Now, instead of all that data, we have radar, GPS, cameras, leader, ultrasonic, all being collected by a little gadget, say, inside the car. So some of the some data goes to the cloud storage for analytics, uh, for services, right? And some encrypted data collection, data storage and analytics, data analy uh, analytics and data sharing between the different vehicles and so on. But they all have to be guided by policies. And one thing with policies, these are not toy policies, right? Because much of our previous work on policies, and I'll give an example later, has focused on things like, um, right, I, I share something with you, uh, but do, I share something with John, I tell John, but don't tell Mary, but no, that's not what happens in the real world. Policies are quite complex. And so we are working with a policy expert uh, in our university. And so hopefully we can develop some realistic policies. It's really crucial, the policy, policy area. Okay, so now this is actually part three, right? Part one, big data, uh, security, big data, I mean, integrating cybersecurity and AI, part two, is uh, is the the infrastructures uh, internet of transportation and infrastructures and security and how we apply ai ml and part three is our third area which is and again looking at the time okay so social media security and privacy okay so so we have done a lot of work on social media analytics Right, using machine learning algorithms, such as location mining, uh, extracting various demographics. So we look at all the social media, in particular, we have looked at Twitter and tried to find out a person's location. So again, very simple algorithms. I mean, I'm just, we, we have, I'm talking about some of the simple algorithms, but ours are much more complicated because we really want to find pinpoint and find accurate locations because what's the point, right? If you're in California, Right? What's the point in, in um, giving, you know, giving information, marketing information about pizza uh, restaurants in Dallas, Texas? No, you want uh, restaurants in California. So location vector for John. Uh, right, so friend one, you look at the friends. Friend one is in uh, Dallas, Seattle, Richardson, Sydney, but you have two of that, right? 
Dallas. Friend two is in Dallas in India in Sunnyvale. Uh, friend three, Austin, Minneapolis, and friend four. So for Dallas is going to, so all these friends, but then you compute uh, the probabilities and so on, and then you try to figure out where he is. So again, the assumption here, agglomerative clustering, is that you are like your friend. Okay, so we go into multiple levels. And so here we have John Doe, right? Where is John Doe living? So we look at the friends and there is, it's not as straightforward as I'm presenting it because we have a number of papers. Also it's patented technology. And so we find uh, the location of John Doe so that we can do uh, marketing. And then, right, so it shows in this particular case, it's Dallas Richardson Plano. And so you can say it's a DFW area. Okay, so we've come up with, uh, uh, you know, AIDS for social media and our contributions. We developed a system and I think I'm going to, right. So I let me put all these things and okay. So we've developed a system called Insight. Uh, Insight is going to provide marketing. So based on our algorithm, which is tweet, tweeted, the previous finding the locations demographic. So, I'm not going to go into too much detail here. So based on all of the information, we do analytics and look at all the profiles and uh, social uh, you know, behavioral aspects and so on. And then we uh, gather all the tweets and uh, do appropriate marketing. So we can, we develop three graph based location mining algorithms for online social networks, uh, map location mining to care nearest neighbors and supervising graph partitioning. It outperforms some of the content-based uh, approach in time and accuracy, relationship between geospatial proximity and friendships and effective geographical mobility on current locations of users. So we Insight is a uh, is sort of a, not even dual purpose. It can be applied because we have got plug and play modules. And so we've applied for marketing. We can apply for national security, catching the bad guys. And also it can be applied for law enforcement and perhaps even for cybersecurity. And so that's sort of our analytics work. But of course, with all of this uh, analytics that we are doing, there's a worry. What's the worry? Privacy. Okay, so we also did a lot of work on privacy. What did we do? So we looked at 167,000 profiles from Facebook online social network restricted to public profiles in the Dallas Fort Worth over 3 million links. Uh, we have different components, right? The social media graph structure. So 16, uh, diameter is 16 of the largest component, 167,000 nodes, links are 3 million, number of traced attributes over 4 million, unique traits 110, number of components eight, uh, probability liberal, because in tech we've already find out is a person liberal or conservative. If a person explicitly states he's a liberal or conservative, we take it, take, remove that trait. And the whole challenge, can we decide whether, determine whether a person is liberal or conservative? If he says he works, uh, he voted for the Democratic Party, the chances are he's liberal. If he voted for the Conservative Party, uh, sorry, Republican Party, the chances are he's conservative. So all of those traits we remove, right? The probability of liberal is 45%, conservative is 55, 0.55. And so here are some of the traits uh, such as, uh, these are okay, liberal traits, legalized same-sex marriage. Every time I find a cute boy is conservative, little part of me dies. So equal rights for gays, right? So, so then we, it was fairly accurate. We got a lot of, my, my colleague, Dr. Kantajalu, Murat Kantajalu, he was the main investigator for this work. We got a lot of uh, uh, publicity because at the same time we were doing this work, MIT was doing work to figure out is a person gay or straight? So because in my, uh, being a mighty, of course, they got coverage. And of course, being gay or straight is an interesting topic. And another sort of interesting, not as much as being gay or straight, but again, somewhat interesting is also being conservative or liberal. So this was very interesting. So the point is privacy could be violated. What should we do? So we said, okay, do we do privacy preserving social media? But then we are all, I mean, how can we do it, right? Privacy preserving because everybody is posting so many things. So that's a bit of a challenge. There are some who have looked at privacy preserving social media. So, uh, you know, before someone posts, do we want to quickly, should a social media company like Facebook quickly check and then say it's false or your privacy, warn you, your privacy is violated. So things like that, maybe we could do. 
So these, these are very important things that we need to look into. And I'll talk a little bit about this later. Okay, so with respect to security, uh, we also looked at access control for social media. So here we use semantic web technologies. Semantic web was uh, invented by Tim, Sir Tim Berners-Lee. And now of course it has evolved into knowledge graphs. So we use SWIRL, semantic web's rules language to specify all the policies. And so, uh, so we did, uh, Right, so online social media. So we looked at so video objects. So these are some of our policies. So we looked at video database, our social media. So why uh, analytics work here was tweet, uh, tweets, Twitter. Here we looked at Facebook and here we looked at fourth, friend of a friend. It's an open source, uh, what the semantic web community has come up with a social network called fourth. So we had rules such as if the video of a target object parent of Bob controls what Bob sees. And if the owner of the target object is Bob, the photo or video, and it's a photo, then Bob's friends can see it. So these are the policies. And then we implemented these policies. So our research is actually efficient way of rewriting these policies, right? And then we built an architecture. So we had the social media network application, this is a reference monitor, that part of the system that has to be critically, I mean, highly secure because that is intercepting all the, all the um, access to the uh, data. So all the policies are implemented by the reference monitor. So it has to be secure. And so we also want to make it small. And then we have a semantic web reasoning engine, the policies are stored here and the knowledge, all of the uh, information, social media information is here. And so all of the requests are mediated by the reference monitor, right? So this is our architecture. And uh, we got some very interesting uh, results, right? Access control models. So that was, I think, one of the early works on uh, access control for social media. Okay, so uh, then what we did, a side project. This is just another uh, a side thing that I want to mention. We said, okay, what about uh, information sharing. Remember policy-based information sharing, I said, security, privacy, uh, for data collection, data analytics. So information sharing, we did something really interesting. So we um, built, developed a cloud, Hadoop MapReduce-based cloud, and then we built policy engine, right? Implemented in the cloud. So our policy engine is, you know, is a policy translation and transformation layer. Uh, the user interface. And so uh, we use the MapReduce, a query engine. So two parts, a policy engine and the query engine. These are two things that we designed and implemented in the cloud. So when you say implemented in the cloud, it's not just implementing it and porting, P-O-R-T, into the cloud. We, we sort of implemented the whole thing in the cloud, taking advantage of the cloud. And so we had to share information in the cloud. So we had, say, agency one, agency two, agency three. So we had we demonstrated it between University of Texas, Dallas, King's College, University of London, and University of Insubria, Italy. And so we had, our policies were a bit toy policies, right? So I, if, if London asks Dallas, okay, can you give me this data? I will say justify, or I will tell London, I will give you this provided you give me something else. Or I will tell London, I will give you this provided you don't give it to somebody else. And that was designed and implemented. What would be nice in the future is to have social net media, people in a social network sharing information in the cloud according to policies. And it could be multiple social networks by agency one, agency two, agency three, within a social network, across social networks. So this is sort of for the future, okay? So this is something that we thought of doing for emergency preparedness uh, and reconstructing after say, uh, a war or something, reconstructing a region, but we really didn't uh, complete that part of it. But this is something in the future, but we do have the cloud system, sorry, uh, design and implemented information sharing in the cloud. Okay, so now uh, another thing is, can AI be for social good in the midst of cyber attacks and privacy violations, right? This is something that's very near and dear to me because, you know, focusing on uh, social good, for AI for good, but especially for children, right, to, to protect children against violence, violence against children. And so without a doubt, AI is helping because 
you know, if children can carry some sensors and so on, we can find out whether the sense children are being abused, right? So AI techniques being applied to solve societal problems, detecting the spread of diseases, emergency preparedness, education, child traffic, trafficking, violence against women, fair, but AI has to be biased. I mean, we don't want the AI to be biased. AI has to be fair. You know, we don't want discriminate, discriminatory practices. The technologies being developed for social good are also causing problems. Uh, because all of these machine learning techniques extract patterns, trends, and make predictions, causing privacy violations, even worse, the machine learning techniques may be attacked, right? So one of the things that, uh, with you know, you give children all these gadgets to make sure that they are not being abused, but these uh, gadgets could be used, right? People can target these children for child trafficking and so on. So it's sort of a, a problem. So privacy has to be protected. And then, of course, we hear about the fake news, machine learning techniques being applied uh, to detect fake news in social media, training from numerous articles, and then testing. Uh, so one of the things we need to keep track is data provenance for determining the source, right? So whenever the fake news is posted, we want to go and trace back, where did it come from, right? It's a challenge because it could have come from humans or it could come from bots, right? Uh, so we don't know. So security attacks exacerbate the problem, malicious bots creating the fake news. So major challenge faced by AI security and social media researchers, right? And of course, now with COVID-19, okay, one thing was with the politics and all kinds of bad stuff, fake news being posted for political purposes. But now with COVID-19, we are talking about life or death. And what if fake news is posted? You know, they say, oh, you don't have to wear masks. Okay. Or they say, uh, things like, oh, this vaccine is really great, but the, that particular vaccine could be bad. So these are things that we've got to be, you know, really concerned about whenever there is a, you know, political violence or whenever there is a major pandemic like we are faced with or terrorism. So we really have to tackle this problem. So policymakers, regulators, researchers, uh, technologists, and uh, so they all and governance folks, we all have to work together. And I believe that data provenance is a major aspect here. Okay, so now the last chart. So I think time wise, you know, I wanted to stop about 10 minutes before my time. So I think I started uh, probably, I think I'm just about, I we'll have time for about at least, you know, hopefully some time for questions. Okay, so Summary and directions. Just to recap, what have, what have we discussed? One, uh, integrating cybersecurity and data science, right? I talked about big data security and privacy, data science for or machine learning for, uh, for cybersecurity, and what happens if the cybersecurity uh, techniques are attacked. And then I talked about Internet of Transportation, right? So it's a particular type of Internet of Things. Remember, that's not the only type. We've got Internet of... Uh, Internet of uh, medical stuff, Internet of financial stuff, Internet of almost everything. So then I talked about uh, security, a particular solution that we developed. And I said privacy was important and then gave some ideas on how we can apply part one to part two, right? How we can apply um, machine learning to solve some of these challenges, security problems for Internet of Transportation. And also I mentioned about what happens if these machine learning techniques are attacked. Then I talked about social media. Social media analytics, our work with Twitter data, uh, extracting demographics. And then I talked about social media privacy, our work with so, uh, Facebook data. And then I talked about um, social media security, access control. And I talked about fourth social media, friend of a friend, uh, developed by the semantic web community. Okay. And then I talked about how AI, uh, can AI be for social good, right? What about fake news? and social media governance, so all that is important. So finally, summary and directions. So Internet of Transportation, with the development of Internet of Things, including Internet of Transportation, systems infrastructure, security privacy solutions are being developed, mainly physics-based solutions. As driverless cars become a reality, more and more of the AVs will use machine learning techniques, right? So. How can we develop AI solutions for detecting malware in AV systems? And how can adversarial machine learning work in AV systems, AVs, autonomous vehicles? 
Again, can we develop a privacy aware policy based data management framework for the Internet of Transportation and infrastructures? And of course, uh, can we use trustworthy analytics such as the Intel's SGX uh, platform? In the area of social media, of course, numerous benefits of AI, including for social good, right? Social media analytics for marketing, but we need to ensure cybersecurity and privacy. AI being applied to social media for detecting the spread of COVID-19, what about the security and privacy implications? AI being applied to social media for detecting fake news, both the content and the source. What if the attacks are due to cybersecurity violations, right? It's like bots spreading all this bad information or fake information. And of course, what about solutions? You know, what about massive amounts of data, right? We have we need solutions that are scalable, regardless of whether it's internet or transportation or social media, cloud, parallel processing, high performance computing. And again, scalability cuts across all aspects, right? Integrating um, various types of data, big data, security, privacy, social media, and so on. So regardless of internet or transportation or for social media. So that ends my presentation. And now I'd like to thank all my colleagues, Professor Alvaro Cardenas, uh, for the work on Internet of Transportation, Murak Kantajalu for adversarial machine learning for Latifa Khan, and also social media privacy for Latifa Khan, data science for cybersecurity and social media analytics. Uh, Dr. Raul Quinones is our PhD, joint PhD students between Dr. Cardenas and myself. And uh, so he's finished his thesis was on Internet of Transportation. Of course, our project coordinator, Ms. Rhonda Walls. So I'm going to stop sharing. And so again, this sort of ends my presentation. And uh, again, reiterating, you know, three, um, three main topics, right? One is uh, integrating cybersecurity and AI, right? So we talked about big data security, privacy, cybersecurity, uh, data science or machine learning for cybersecurity and what happens if the cybersecurity uh, techniques, are machine learning techniques, sorry, machine learning techniques are attacked. Then I talked about Internet of Transportation, right, which is uh, uh, the Internet of Transportation, uh, what happens to security and privacy, because we have, we have Internet of Transportation already, right, we are beginning, lots more stuff to, lot more, um, uh, automation to carry out for land, for ground vehicles, for aerial vehicles, as well as for uh, sea vehicles. So as we do more and more automation, of course, security challenges and privacy challenges. And so I talked about our security solutions, what can happen to, uh, what about privacy and how can we apply AI and machine learning. Then I talked about social media, social media analytics with Twitter, social media, uh, privacy with respect to Facebook, and then social media access control for four, friend of a friend, and then talked about how we can apply AI and uh, cybersecurity for social media, right? So now the future, of course, it's everything what I've discussed, right? We absolutely need AI, machine learning, data science, because massive amounts of data being collected. And I just talked for on a Two applications, Internet of Transportation and, uh, and social media. Last week, I gave a keynote address where I talked about AI and data science, and my focus was on uh, the COVID-19 and the privacy implications. So it was very interesting. I, I worked, uh, I wrote a paper. Remember, I, I call it the landmark paper, data, uh, data mining, counterterrorism, civil liberties, uh, privacy and civil liberties. And for this keynote, I Last week, I wrote at IEEE Big Cyber, I wrote a paper very similar. Uh, instead of data mining, I call it data science and COVID-19 uh, and privacy and civil liberties, right? So it's very interesting to see uh, this, the differences and the similarities. But regardless, we, have, we are living in a very exciting times because of all these technologies, but we are also living in very dangerous times because of security, privacy, and of course, we have got terrorism, and worst of all, we've got this COVID-19, and so we need AI data science but and machine learning, but we also need security and privacy. And so again, thank you very much, and I'll see you all 24 hours from now, and again, thanks. And so I'm going to end this.